Josh, thank you so much. Uh, Gunjan, nice to see you. Uh, uh, how are you doing? How are things? <laughs> good, uh, good, Ditesh. Yeah. Thanks. And, and, and also, I want to ask you, how are you doing? Yeah, all yeah, good. Things, I think... are, uh, uh, things are crazy, you know. <laughs> and uh, But I think, uh, as always, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe uh, any uh, situation that doesn't break you brings the best out of you and absolutely uh, and i'm seeing that not just in um, uh you know the community as a whole uh friends and family but also uh particularly our organization that i'm working working with and uh so yeah so no it's it's a lot of positives but you know at the same time uh, we're all anxious want to get this behind us as soon as possible yeah. but that, that goes without saying how, how, are things, how are things with you? What are yeah, you? same here. Same here. You know, we're isolated. Uh, we're close to New York City, so we have to go by what uh, Cuomo and de Blasio do these days. So, <laughs> you know, uh, depending on where they are. So, but uh, all good. You know, seven weeks now in the house. Uh, can't remember the last time I actually left the house to go anywhere. So, all good. <laughs> so, why don't we, uh, you know, for the participants who are on, just a quick introduction. Uh, um, I'm uh, Ritesh Patel. I work at Ogilvy Consulting in New York, and we focus on digital transformation, innovation uh, for our clients. And uh, with me today, uh, an amazing individual out in California. Look at that bridge. Yes. Uh, Gunjan, why don't you a quick background on who, you and where you work and what you're doing? Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, following Ritesh's lead, I thought that introduce some. Uh, something positive in, uh, in, in my video. <laughs> and uh, so I am in California. I uh, work at uh, uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance. I'm the chief digital officer there. Uh, I, I'm based in California, hence the background. I'm not faking it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, I have a prior, previous to Walgreens Boots Alliance, I worked at uh, uh, Walt Disney Company, uh, part of the Disney Plus uh, <clears throat> effort. Uh, before that, I was at Amazon, Microsoft. And so it's basically a digital person all along, but uh, also a very passionate believer in customer and particularly healthcare and as an opportunity, as a space, which I you know, would uh, love to pick Ritesh, your brain during this conversation yeah. as well a little bit because you truly have, you know, at the center of that. But yeah, that's that's what I am. So currently, uh, you know, at Walgreens Boots Alliance, we operate the retail business, the pharmacy business, and obviously we are a significant uh, participant in the healthcare uh, side. In fact, uh, yesterday, one of my colleagues with the president of Walgreens, Richard Ashworth, he was at the White House. Yeah, uh, I saw. President Trump, yeah. uh, you know, uh, announcing our initiatives for the COVID testing and all that. So yeah, we are uh, right in the middle of uh, a lot of the activity. How long have you been there? Good going right now, as well as trying to. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You you cut out. So I thought you had paused. My apologies. Um, I, I was just wondering how long have you been at Walgreens now? Um, uh, about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. And do you think you know your experience at Walt Disney? Because Disney is so focused on the customer. Yes. And particularly some of the innovations that are, I remember talking to a new few retail clients who would always use Disney as that benchmark of how they get the people through the, the, the whole, you know, experience and through the, uh, the Disney environment. Did that help you in where you are today? Does that, do you look at some of those things and go? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a great question because um, Disney is, an amazing company in the sense of uh, the specific parts that created Disney, uh, the theme park, particularly in the movie studios, uh, they're so obsessed about their customer. And as you said, know their customer so well. At the same time, like all companies, when they grow, you know, when the last 50 years and 60 years, and in my case, Walgreens are over a hundred years. Yeah. Over time, your operationals, operations and your silos and your processes and the quarterly earnings focus, all of these stuff takes over. And um, quite often what that means is the customer um, becomes a peripheral part of the overall conversation. And what's, you know, so for example, 
even in Disney, there was a notion of uh, a theme parks customer versus a movie studio customer, not a Disney uh-huh. customer. And uh, and what you know, and and what digital is doing as a whole, I'm sure uh, you you're seeing this in your clients and partners as well. And now, particularly with COVID, it's really unifying the customer journey across. You know, customers don't define themselves as a channel customer mm. or a mm. product customer. They just want to live their life. And so I really have seen my role um, as really in the executive team being the champion of that customer. And, and something that's, and, and to your point, to your question, Disney experience really helped me not just in uh, understanding the best practices, but also to navigate the corporate silos and the corporate operational, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it's good training, right? And Disney the, to be able to do that at Walgreens. Now, do you, what do you, you know, obviously we're going through some crazy times. How, how do you think, you know, you, you mentioned it's a hundred year old business. How are they coping? Was there any sort of playbooks around all this that you saw? Or is it like everybody else at the moment, you know, whoa, we've, we've just been hit by a big Mack truck and we don't know what to do. Uh, how, how are things going? I wish there was a playbook. I, I, yeah. I, I think <laughs> the world as a whole, I yeah. don't think anyone in the world has has or had a playbook for what, what we've experienced. And honestly, if you think you had a playbook, then 24 hours later, it would be outdated because right. you know, the circumstances are changing so fast. So no, I think uh, it was, uh, it has been, and it continues to be literally, an, you know, an, uh, really a test of your leadership and crisis management. Mm-hmm. There's no, no, no other way to define it or describe it. You know. In your case, I mean, you know, we're on lockdown, but some of, as far as you're concerned, in, in your frontline staff, they're all sort of essential, if you wish, right? They're providing pharmacy yeah. services and things like that. How's that going internally? Yeah, and that, 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 that's really, uh, I think you hit it right on the head. I think it, it's, we, uh, you know, one of the few categories of businesses, we don't, we did not and do not have the option to just complete shutdown, which would exactly. have been probably, uh, you know, best for employees and team members perspective, but we exactly, like you said, pharmacy, you know, we, and even essential, you know, right. location for many, many customers, uh, we are really literally the closest and the only viable retail location mm. for essential uh, items. So uh, we have to keep things running and at the same time have an obligation for help. So, yeah. You know, we, I mentioned the COVID-19 testing, but even internally within stores, you know, we really had to think about how to make sure our team members are not only providing this additional services beyond up, you know, beyond what they were normally doing while keeping them safe mm-hmm. and continue to support them uh, from the headquarters. And it, that's really it. So you're right. Yeah, we you know all our stores are running. In fact, uh, we, have uh, you know even enhanced some of our offerings like uh, uh, yeah? Tell me about some of those new. Yeah, I saw a Postmates agreement recently announced. Are those the kinds of innovations you're looking at at the moment to enhance yeah, some yeah. of these things? Yeah, Postmates because yeah. as I mentioned earlier, the journeys that we are witnessing the world, and I'm sure uh, I'd love to hear your point of view as well on this. But the journeys are becoming digital, hmm. right? Hmm. And it's it's no longer an afterthought. It's no longer um, a nice to have or a secondary thing. It is the only way our customer starts, you know, uh, even choosing and browsing the item and building the basket. So one of the things we um, our teams put together very quickly was this idea of an essential basket, essential items of fifty that you can order online and pick up. Uh, you using a drive-through. I mean, many of our stores have drive-through capabilities. Okay. Um, and that you know, was rolled out within a few stores within a week, and then we're very soon rolling out uh, a wider network. But you know, that was something we could do right away to just get people the basics without having the anxiety, because the, the challenge we gave the team was uh, the worst thing we can do at this time is have a customer take the risk of 
um, going to the store for something essentially and you know taking whatever risk associated with yeah. uh, being out of their house and not finding uh, what they what they need. So at a minimum, we should make you know uh, can make the browsing experience convenient. So are you sort of doing this from a use case perspective, or are you looking at sort of accelerating some of those things you were thinking about for this year? Because you know it's a big scale issue for you. You've got massive scale. How do you roll out something consistently across the portfolio from a transformation perspective that's being forced upon you? How how are you approaching some of those thoughts? Uh, and then th that's a great question. I think that's that's really in the it's it, that's really it. It's really mm. the use cases. Honestly, um, having come from an e-commerce world uh, and mm. Amazon, I think we had them defined. We had talked about them. We, uh, you know, at various levels of uh, development and maturity of those. Mm. But it was really the scale, which was mm. always the debate, like mm. how quickly, because that's, a, as you said, you know, when you are operating a store chain of uh, nearly 9,000 stores in the U.S., everything becomes a big number very fast yeah. in terms of so and uh, and now we are at that point where we we have to do that and it's so like you said what digit what you know this crisis is doing is accelerating forcing us to accelerate like many i talked to several retailers and they're all in the same boat they're really kind of forced uh, but i think thankfully we had been talking about this. We had a number of plans, and then we, uh, and this is one of the advantages of when the operations uh, are in charge that they are actually very good at absorbing um, new new solutions and scaling it out. Mm. You know, we have a, a tremendously uh, powerful operational uh, or backbone that supports our stores. In, right up to the people who work in the store, the team members who work in the stores to accept new solutions. And so I'm, I'm pretty confident, but yes, nonetheless, it is, it is uh, even if your car can drive a hundred miles an hour, when you actually go there, it doesn't feel, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Where's the engine? Bite, yeah. Bite your nails. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some, I'm sure there's some great things coming out of it. I, you know, I, I think there was a cartoon Josh has put up before we arrived onto being live about these guys talking about, you know, transformation and this big COVID ball about to hit the building, right? Yes, I saw that. Was really yeah, that was really good, I thought, right? So I'm sure everybody's struggling with it. But, you know, as you said, your scale is such, and I'm sure you had a plan probably for this year that you were going to go execute against. The culture must be an interesting item because you're dealing with people who for a hundred years have been doing something a certain way. What was the, you know, how has that been? Uh, has people, have people changed on a dime? Has it been easy or is it difficult to at least, you know, you get some pockets of friendlies and there are others saying, Oh my God, what's going on? Well, I think that I would describe that that was sort of the situation uh, before the crisis, I mm -hmm. think what in and and I you know hate to find a uh, say something positive when everybody is just uh, dealing with so much anxiety, yeah. but I think from an execution perspective, transformation yeah. perspective, the positive has been a lot of that hesitation or debate uh, or uh, who's in you know where to get the decision approved and. Uh, I we don't don't want to you know define it as a bureaucracy, but simply all that all that additional conversation, unnecessary conversation. There is a general awareness because of this that we may just need to move. We have to move yeah. fast, and that means there may be situations where uh, certain decisions will need to be made in real time, and uh, we can course correct if somebody wants to optimize it. But there is you know, just moving uh, sort of perfect is the, you know, enemy of now, that mentality has really crept in that uh, urgency. And then if it's in service of getting our customers and keeping the house in order, let's just move. So I think it has really, I, I keep hearing from my teams that they feel, uh, you know, more uh, agile, more empowered, mm -hmm. just, 
to do what they always wanted to do. So is there a morale shift? Is there a sense of excitement in your team, perhaps, on let's figure things out, let, yes. let's make things better? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, no, I think, and I actually, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a combination of, it's a, a combination of adrenaline and anxiety, and sometimes that I don't know. Mm. Yeah, maybe, I, you're right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, once that wears off a little, what, yeah, but I, in fact, sometimes wonder, is like, what is there is a way to, uh, you know, sustain this yeah. energy? But yeah, so there's certainly a very, and I'm, I'm really proud of the team, uh, you know, they're, while dealing with all of these and you know we have families and uh, exactly uh, the disruption to almost everything we do on a daily basis uh, you know young kids or parents and yet uh, you know the focus and the output of work has been phenomenal how how are you organize and did you have to make some organizational shifts as you looked at this, because I'm sure you sort of had an innovation organization under you or, you know, a digital organization. Maybe you can go into a little bit about how you're set up and then if you had to make any shifts uh, in the last few weeks because of all yeah, this. No, I think last few weeks, one of the things we decided was not introduce any more change than what is there because what we discovered was as being in this crisis response mode, uh, the people who are passionate and driven and mature and uh, really focused on the customer, they figured things out. They, you know, they didn't require uh, an org change to work with somebody across three departments. Uh, it's just like-minded people. All it's a, there was that. That's what I, I feel. It's been remarkable. The the sense of mission and purpose is mm. just so clear across the organization that people, it enabled people to work together, come together for a common goal and get it done. Uh, so that's, and, but that all of that said, I, I do think, you know, as uh, Drew was speaking earlier, uh, when we do come out of this, uh, the world is going to be changed in permanent ways, in, at least in some ways, permanently. And uh, so we will need, I, I'm confident that uh, we, will be, we will need some organizational change to um, be, uh, you know, be um, uh, ready for that scenario. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think if you go back to your Disney experience, you know, I think, and you may agree that that customer journey that retailers have been so used to has been completely disrupted. And, you know, and I think there's going to be a behavior shift. Have you sort of guys thought about that journey? Are you starting to think about that as to, you know, what happens after? Yes. Yeah? Yes. And then, and that's really where most of my time right now is going in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about and aligning the organization on that journey. So then we can that that agreement on the journeys will inform what you said about how we organize, what we prioritize, and where we invest uh, our resources of innovation. Um, mm. And well, and, and I I don't I really it needs to be in my opinion around the customer because mm. I mean one of the organizational challenges almost every organization faces is digital. Looks like we have IT capabilities yeah. or, you know, and I kind of think it shouldn't really be anything. It's there's one customer journey and some components of that journey would be digital and some components of that journey would be, you know, basically whatever makes sense, you know, if for the customer, if I'm, if it's convenient for me to get stuff delivered to my door, then it's, that's the right thing. If it's ideal for me to deliver, pick it up using a drive through then that's what I'll do. Right. So, you know, we've got a lot of people probably on the call, some of them from large corporations like yours, you know, with the scale and the heft, plus all the bureaucracy and everything else, who are probably doing the same thing you were in January, making plans and putting things together. What kind of guidance or advice can you give those folks around some of the things that you're doing that, you know, that could be interesting or nuggets of things they could go back to their office with? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And and again, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it would be great to hear your thoughts after this mm. because I, I think you are you have the unique position of uh, working across different 
divisions yeah. and, and particularly, uh, you know, I think many institutions in the healthcare field who are really at the front line. And I, I really believe yeah. uh, every time I talk to somebody in the true healthcare part, you know, hospital systems and so forth, and I feel like uh, going to boot camp in terms of uh, crisis management, you know, as they're juggling. So I'd love to hear your thought. But I think, you know, listen, what we've learned is uh, the most important thing is to truly let your customer lead you rather than uh, pontific you pontificating or trying to debate or hesitate what they're going to do because customers and particularly their actions speak louder than words i mean it, it's just you may think they're going to need one one thing or behave one way and uh, it's going to be you know you know i for example you know uh, whether it's uh, drive-through or curbside or mm -hmm. do people still believe, feel like they want to come inside and or do, do they want to pre-order mm -hmm. almost all of these decisions we can debate all day long but i think seeing what customers actually behave uh, has really been uh, one big lesson uh, to inform because that cuts through the a lot of the internal debate and the hesitation and the yeah, second it goes down the silos, right? And the empires yeah. and territories and politics of everything, right? Exactly. Because yeah. it, it just exactly depoliticizes it just because yeah. it, it's uh, not territorial. And then the second thing is like trusting the frontline employees. I think they truly, truly, uh, even, you know, even a part time worker, if they are touching the day to day, operations and your customers on a day-to-day -day basis the insight they can provide um, on anything is just so so critical because they other than that you know you can hire uh, all sorts of uh, you know research and consultants yeah. and all of that but at the end of the day the when they give you the truth because what it does is it's it's it helps you differentiate is what I found. You know, it gives yeah. you insights that only you have if you truly listen to the frontline workers, because that's that may be unique to your business, to your customers, or they may be able to identify a problem before your competition or before, you know, it becomes a common knowledge. So I think from a pur for purposes of innovation, starting with your customers and your frontline uh, team members, in my opinion, uh, is probably the most significant uh, uh, tool or technique management can have to really differentiate. And in your role, you know, as you look at, you know, chief digital officer, and you were brought in a, well, a year and a bit ago, I guess, right? It, it, was there a mandate? And do you think some of the things that you're mandated to do will be speeded up now or uh, get sticky? Sure. Yeah, yes and yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, because of this, again, um, I think, you know, when an organization is this big, and I've seen it at Disney and I've seen it at Amazon, yeah. we all have lots of uh, priorities and agendas and multiple fronts we need to serve. And I believe when an organization gets this big, it is inevitable that uh, there is a lot of debate and uh, especially when it comes to uh, resource planning and prioritization and investment and focus mm -hmm. uh, everybody's scattered and pulled in multiple directions and which one to prioritize and i think a lot of that uh, is reduced and it, which has resulted in increased focus now and particularly i think it goes without saying that digital would be uh, the primary way uh, the customer. So, yeah, it's absolutely what you said is correct. So if you were to, you know, look at sort of six months from now, we are starting to calm down. Things are getting semi-normal, we hope. We don't get a second wave, right? What are some of the things you think fundamentally has changed in the Walgreens business from a digitization perspective or innovation? Uh, I think, you know, pre-call, we had a call a couple of days ago with Drew. We talked about things like open APIs and connectivity to ecosystems and partners. Are you are you there? Do you think? Uh, what are some yeah. of the things you think will stick going forward? Can yeah, you know? no, I think so. That is excellent. So, listen, I'm a big. I've been a big believer uh, even before I joined Walgreens that 
uh, retail uh, for physical retail the long-term opportunity is not necessarily to operate as a monolith, uh, fully vertically integrated. Uh, so if you really look at all components of retail, of uh, the location, the real estate, the employees, the merchandise, the back office supply chain, uh, you know, every retail business has an end-to-end sort of stovepipe. And I really think for retail in, in the days of, you know, in the era of Amazon, uh, the only way for retail is to consider each store as part of an ecosystem where you can think of those capabilities I listed as a decomposition that one person, you know, you can have a re- 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 imagine uh, retail as the location and decouple from the merchandise, right? I mean, uh, so there is a, if you look at what's happening now in the restaurant business where we had restaurants which were also a monolith that you had the real estate and then, then you cooked food there, you served your customers there and everything was in one place. But now in the era of cloud kitchen, what's happening is the physical real estate in the kitchen is one place, but the food consumption is happening in people's homes or in some other location. And, and to your point about extensibility and API, the chefs are no longer employees of Cloud Kitchen. They are like Uber drivers. They just go in for a couple of hours, essentially rent the kitchen, deliver their merchandise. So I believe retail has this opportunity with open APIs, where if you really look at a retail location as exposing its capabilities through APIs and for others to plug in. Uh, And now in the physical world, I mean, Amazon did this, 20 years ago when it was, you know, sell on Amazon where others could just list their goods and use the Amazon infrastructure of search and fulfillment. And then later they expanded it to the warehousing. So I think there's no, I, I just uh, I think there's no reason that cannot happen in physical retail and open APIs are the ways to uh, make it happen in the cloud. Oh. Is enabling that. So, you know, you talked about Amazon a little bit. There's a brand value there. There's also a trust value mm-hmm. that built up over time, right, with their customers, with things like Prime and availability of products. Yes. They've also got to know their customers pretty well through data that they collect and all of that personalization. Do you see somebody like a Walgreens who's got a tradition and a heritage of 100 years of bricks and mortar? Do you think they'll get there? Do you think the, I think the Walgreens name, I think the brand is trusted, but... Do you, can digital and innovation and disruption continue delivering against that? Do you think? What do you think? I mean, that, that's Is really that it. something it, you discuss. It, it, so, yeah. So first of all, I mean, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe we could get there. Uh, but uh, but to your point, uh, jokes aside, that is really the crux of it: is balancing that trust while opening uh, to enable scale and the ecosystem participation. How do you maintain that trust? And it's a it's it's a challenge. I mean, it's not just a challenge for Walgreens. I think even when I was at Amazon, it was a challenge there at Amazon. There were so yeah, many, yeah. That, you know, that you make for scale and do you maintain trust, right? And you, so yeah, so that, that's really it. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally, because ultimately I think a, a business needs to realize that they're, you know, in the business of trust and trust is the only way to you know, maintain brand equity. So. It's a different, uh, I think part of it is a different governance model or a different way of managing the business as well. You're going to need new types of managers coming in as well, I think, right? You may have merchandisers, as you said, and the customer service folks, but you may need some new kind of uh, governance and expertise around this. Very much so. And I see Drew's come on to crash our party, which we... No, well, I'm I'm actually... End of the day. I'm actually coming on because Ritesh, both Gunjan and I, and I'm sure many of the people out there want to hear a bit from you as well. And I know yes, you're, you're, too mo- you're too modest to turn the conversation <laughs> back to yourself. So I'm going to do it. But, okay. um, <laughs> but um, you know, yeah. And so Ritesh, I, you know, you and I have had so many great experiences together and you talk to so many different companies across the entire sort of healthcare and wellness, you know, um, value chain from hospital groups to retailers yeah. to insurance companies. Um, you know, I guess a top line question of, you know, they're obviously all innovating right now. We know that. Um, what do you see is that's going to be sticky coming out on the other side in terms of the way these companies are operating differently and, and more acceptance of, 
of all those things that you need to do with digital transformation, being agile, failing fast. Um, what, what's that light at the end of the tunnel for you? And, and, and maybe even point out a couple of companies that you think are, sure. are even already on their way to do that. Sure. Uh, you know, I would say one thing, you know, and Gunjan knows this as well. In the healthcare industry, there are two pockets of it. You know, one area is you can't really go fast because people may die, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, healthcare, particularly the health systems, where if you're going to deploy some new innovation that impacts the patient, you've got to make sure it's safe and secure and sound and all of those things. So they've all used that as a, a barrier to innovate. You know, I don't want to do that because if I get it wrong, somebody might die and there's some legal issues, but there's a more moral issue and all of those things. And all of those things have gone out the window at the moment. People are 3D printing masks in the hospital, right, without ever testing them. Where in the old days, you would have had to print it, test it, clinical trial it, certify it, get it into procurement, and then one day a nurse will be wearing it. Today, they're printing it and wearing it straight away. So, right. you know, those kinds of disruptions are going on very quickly. So I think some of those will stick because it's shown that you can do it. And actually, nobody got hurt when they right. did it, right? And so let's change the SOP around it. So I think... If you look at the behavior, 30% of what we're doing now may stick. Things like a new normal of telemedicine is now there. So Gunjan, get ready for the pharmacist on demand. And you should be planning for that, I think, right? That I should be able to, just like I have telemedicine with my doctor, I should be able to have a telemedicine with my pharmacist. Hey, is my prescription right. ready? Can I talk to you about my medication? That sort of thing. So I think we are getting used to this. You know, here I am with the Citizen M Hotel in London in the background, mm. uh, which I'll regale you with the story on in a minute. But this has become our new normal. If you remember, I think two years ago, that famous meme where a BBC presenter's kids came running in and his wife came desperately running in and grabbed the kids and dragged <laughs> yeah. them out. Now, if a cat went past just now, everybody will go, oh, well, that's his cat, right? Right, right. Complete new normal. So these kinds of behaviors i think will change how we interact and how we consume we're seeing it in healthcare in delivery uh, gp access telehealth will absolutely stay it's here to stay it'll completely disrupt the gp business uh, gp business uh, because we'll be used to just being on telemedicine through instead of going to you know that annoying call i'm not well can i see the doctor now and somebody rude on the other end of the phone saying tell me what's wrong with you and i'll decide if you want to see them goes away you'll be able to just do it online um, i think on the on the retailer side and some of the things that we've done we're seeing the new normal of again 20 or 30 percent of the population realizing that delivery actually works online ordering actually works you order something and it shows up at your door uh, those who never did it before are now a complete convert around it. And it's so easy and it's becoming easier for me. So I think that will stay as well uh, going forward in some of the conversations we're having. And so that changes a whole infrastructure for people. You're going to have to figure out, right. like Gunjan said, restaurant business. So many restaurants are going to the cloud kitchen concept simply because they can't hire the staff. There's an operator, operational expense that's there. Right. All of those things, right? So I think that will happen. Um, and, and Ritesh, do you, you, know, you and I have talked a lot about open innovation. And I know, um, you know, uh, Gunjan, is, me, Gunjan yeah. is more open now probably than ever in the, in the yeah. company. <laughs> um, you know, will we see this uh, as, as just, you know, more embrace of, of whether it's engaging startups, having hackathons, yep. uh, part, partnerships? any of it I think for for sure the what we call the slow moving industries who were looking at the envy uh, with envy to all the startups and say they can do that and we can't will absolutely change their way I think a lot of companies are now realizing to Gunjan's point that open innovation having an open API so that you can enable partners to innovate with you and connect with you and deliver things with you is going to be crucial. And we're seeing that already. You know, I do these healthcare pop-ups where we bring right. VCs and, and startups and incumbents together to talk about how can we raise all boats by connecting people together. And I always use Uber as an example. They always had this open API that anybody wanted to connect to an Uber service, they could. Uber Health, Uber Eats. You right. Know, the apps. And I think more of that's going to happen for sure. For I sure. agree with yeah. you. Um, so what I'd like to do here is we usually do a poll at the top of the, uh, 
of the session, but we're going to do it in real time here. So Josh, I'm going to have you launch the poll and there's a, uh -oh. so if everybody can, uh, we're not grading you, Gunjan or <laughs> Um if, if all of you out there can do some quick voting here on the poll, we're going to watch the poll results in real time. Um, so I encourage everybody out there uh, to start filling out their poll. And we're going to get some responses here. Uh, I'm curious to see. Um, all right, so here they come. Ah, uh, here we go. Kunjin, close your eyes and ears. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is great. This is free voice of the customer. Yeah, I, I that's right. It's, it's a real-time virtual <laughs> yeah. focus group. Gunjin. Yeah. There's just no window to see everybody. but um, Real-time yeah. feedback. Look at that. Real-time. Yeah, this is great. Um, so, uh, you know, Gunjan, as you, as you see any of these, or Ritesh, as you see any of these, you know, anything standing out, I mean, for number one, filling prescription, people still going to the pharmacy, um, you know, home delivery, um, consulting with the physician. I've, I've been using Plush Care, actually, for quite a while, um, and I really like them, started out of Stanford. Um, so I, I use telehealth, but I have been for a while, and in the future, Shop in physical stores less and use more delivery. Overwhelming there. Yeah. See, uh, there you go. Yeah. Any any thoughts, uh, either of you, just as you're looking at these poll results in real time? And Gunjan, you gonna Gunjan, you can do anything about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is well. I think uh, um, it's uh, it, it supports pretty much you know how we think. I think pharmacy it, there is a there is an aspect of. Uh, just uh, you know, uh, your 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 medicines more important uh, than other things, and people just still like to actually pick it up in person. And yeah. uh, uh, something I have learned from our customers literally over the last year, uh, which you know, having come from an Amazon, everything is delivery kind of culture and that extreme position. I so I, I think it's a uh, it reflects, but it is uh, it is interesting that despite uh, the crisis, that has remained in right. that aspect, and we have been enabling that. We are still trying to you know speed that up and uh, formalize. But I think the touch point of a pharmacist, uh, yeah. as Ritesh was saying, so the what will you know what this will change if this will ch change materially. I think is when. The pharmacist is uh, available virtually as well. And, yeah. uh, I, mean, so I, I agree, and I'm not surprised at these results. I mean, you know, uh, as I said, we've been tracking from a behavior perspective, and a lot of this will stick because, you know, before you, if you didn't have to do it, you didn't do it, right? Yeah. Ah, I don't care. Now I've had to do it, and I've realized how easy it is. Uh, this is actually quite good. I'll keep yeah. going because it helps me. Uh, somebody on the chat mentioned Capsule in the, in New York, particularly, and we've been doing a lot of work. Yeah. There's a number of specialty pharmacies like that. You know, PillPack was a great pioneer of some of that stuff. So it'll, I think all of those things will continue. Uh, um, and I think overall, uh, the way we humans work is once we get into a habit, it's always that, right? We yeah. all in our world, in Virginia, in your world, even at Disney, I remember working at Disney when the band came out, I was working on an interactive TV project there. Uh, and they were saying, yes, if they start wearing it and it's easier for them to use the band yeah. than to do it this way, right. we'll get complete adoption. And that's yeah. exactly what's going yeah, on. That's right. right. Um, one yeah, and I think one of the areas that I actually look for, uh, look at for uh, sort of, customer behavior trend is grocery shopping because for the longest time that's been one of the categories that people still like their weekend daily trips and yeah to produce and make sure it's fresh and didn't touch the didn't trust the online delivery systems enough and because of this crisis is actually the stats i'm seeing in that category are amazing you know it's like a complete flipping the switch yep. Yeah. Uh, I was in the supermarket business. I were really, really str uh, thinking I'd be hiring Gunjan straight away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Gunjan, one uh, one question that came in on the on the on the chat string here, and, and our first panelist today and the first session, sorry, um, talked a little bit about the European consumer, mm -hmm. um, and of course Walgreens with Boots is an established European brand. Um, do you have thoughts on, on you know, the, the European consumer and because and, there is no sort of dominant Amazon across Europe that the cat 
category killers, you know, whether they're DTC or whether they're legacy brands like yours, have a distinct advantage, perhaps. Um, just any thoughts on on how the you know the the consumer in Europe um, or other places where you are um, may come back a bit different, or looking at their habits that that might or might not change. Yeah. So uh, listen, I think first of all, I'm always nervous about treating Europe as a monolithic customer because literally yeah. between country to country, there's just such vast differences. I was on a a Zoom call about two weeks ago, and uh, there were about 20 people from different parts of the world, a lot of Europeans. And in Sweden, they said schools have been open normally for kids below 14. Same, same in Sweden. Same in Sweden. Yeah. I think we've lost Kunjun a little bit. And Italy, they were yeah. saying that they, you are committing a criminal offense. Um, right. Oh. Sure. And okay, I'm back. In Italy, you'd go out, you'd be committing a criminal offense uh, if you went out. So you know, so there's this vast differences across the country. But I think, uh, in comparison to the U.S., it is going to be a little different because I think uh, just the way the countries are laid out, there's more uh, distribute. You know, just. I think the, the delivery networks have not really set up to a lot of the backbones of the country outside the major cities. So the retail and then culturally retail, a physical visit to a store still remains a lot more part of the fabric of yeah. actually having, you know, because like you said, there hasn't been sort of a, I mean, other than maybe even in the UK, other than maybe us boots and I mean, us with boots and Tesco, there's not really a right. nationwide chain. Uh, that you can really have. So it's going to be localized, the behavior change, but uh, I, I do think that it's going to be different when it does come out of the other side. Yeah. And my final question for both of you, and I'd like you both to chip in here and then we're going to have to wrap it up um, is, you know, there was a question also that came in on the chat string about when you were talking about innovation at scale and scale is so critical for you sort of getting in the weeds a little bit in terms of how you've accelerated that innovation in terms of scale. Is it, has it been tools or software that you've used internally with teams? Like what have you actually done to, to, to accelerate the innovation sort of at a real operational level internally? Ritesh, why don't you go first? Okay. So I, yeah, I think there are tools and technologies out there that people have been using. You know, you look at what we're using as a platform right now on collaboration and quick meetings and getting people together from all over the world. I participated in a three hour design thinking workshop using Zoom and Miro not too long ago, where people from six different countries were together, you know, working on a plan and a project. In the traditional way, that would have taken seven flights, six meetings, a uh, huge cost in hotel rooms and conference center. And we did that in three hours in a morning between six and nine in the morning to accommodate the European time zone, right? So I think some of that change is enormously successful and will continue to stay. So, you know, I've seen people use, and you've seen that on, on TV, how Microsoft is now pushing Teams in a long way, in a big right. way. Um, and Teams is another product like that that's pulling people together, quickly sharing things, and then going out and doing things. So uh, I think we'll see more of that. And Gunjan, any tips yeah. on scaling? Uh, totally, scale? totally agree. I think collaboration tools are, uh, I mean, I generally feel uh, everyone's more productive in the mm. organization. Uh, uh, you know, we are spending probably the same amount of time at you know, doing work, but all of that time is actually going towards um, uh, work that is, you know, for a, in service of a project instead of going right. from place A to place B, uh, instead of, you know, getting in a car. And then there is a, there is an expectation of, you know, uh, folks generally available, right? That's right, <laughs> yeah. Both good and That's bad. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so when there is a question, I person is reachable, we set up a meeting and we, you know, we've had meetings at 8.30 and, you know, with our yep. at 11 and then... Yep. I'll go back just to very quickly, Drew, to your scale question. I think the scale issue will always be there for those global, you know, companies like Walgreens Boots Alliance. 
And what Gunjan has done is quite interesting, which is pilot it in three, four, five places, and if it all works, then zoom it out. And I think that format will stay. I don't think there's new ways of doing right. that that I've yeah. seen at any major corporation. It's still very much uh, where I've seen the change is the speed of try it now, where it used yeah, to right. be, you know, we'll do requirements, and we'll do this, and we do that. It's now, okay, we need this, let's do that. Right. Boom. Right, yeah. so it's shrunk in the time, but I think it still will be in major and in big organizations like WBA and and you know any of the large health system chains that we work with. Try it here. If it works, let's just keep going, and then let's roll it out, and then we'll we'll adjust as we go along, and then it right. becomes the standard operating procedure across nine thousand stores. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Gunjan, Gunjan, real quick, do you have sort of test stores that are out there where you've identified stores where you do actually try something and that you use them as the guinea pigs and it's always kind of that store either because of the demographic or whatever? Yeah, we have we have uh, done things like that. But I think we, uh, to Ritesh's point, one of the things that it's, uh, I try very hard to do is uh, because it is a test, it doesn't get diluted in its execution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I try to create a culture that we are still um, trying to essentially prove the business model and, and make the define and make the flywheel work. Right. Just because it's a test, it's not a, a throwaway lab or you can just do things which are not rational. So, but no, no, we have, uh, in fact, even our drive through uh, that we discovered uh, that, that we built just last month, we took first tried first in our home, home market in Chicago with a couple of stores and then slowly uh, yeah. you know yeah so we, we we do that and that's the only way uh, i think to get something in the real world because again like i said i cannot stress the role of the frontline team members yeah because unless they are part of the solution part of the experiment part of it's just not going to scale you're going to okay. hit a big giant hurdle yeah if you don't involve them you know yeah. no matter how well designed it maybe yeah they're the last mile if, if, if yeah. they, it's like if they don't if they're not on board forget yeah. it well look that's a great note to end on um thanks again to both of you i know you're extremely busy and and for sharing the time with us um and i hope to see you um at a cdx in-person event <laughs> sometime soon um Absolutely. i hope and uh, i'm going to uh, thank you thank you again and i'm going to turn it over to josh to wrap us up thanks Kunjan. thank you nice thank to you see you. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you Drew. Thank as you. always it's great to meet you at your event thanks thank you bye great thanks uh thanks both uh to that for that great conversation <laughs>